But we'll open with a quick word of prayer. Let me give you a brief introduction and then I'll tell you uh, about tonight, where, where we're going and, and how to do this for tonight, okay? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, a chance for us to, uh, to look at and to study your word and to think about it well and critically and to interact with it. Uh, God, we want to study your word so that we can know you, so that we can see you, so that we can, uh, Father, you have revealed yourself to us in your word, and so we want to be good students of that, uh, but Father, not for the purpose of being puffed up with knowledge, but rather to simply know you. Uh, we certainly don't want to be Pharisees that um, miss you uh, in the word, and so help us teach us this evening. Make yourself uh, prevalent and uh, help us to apply it at the end of the night. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. If you just wandered in off the street, we uh, have been doing a, uh, uh, we're in week three on sheet. We had an intro week, but, but this, is, this is called uh, Threads. And uh, yeah, so that, that's tonight's. And then if you need a binder, there's those there as you continue to walk in. Tell your friends and your neighbors. Uh, FYI, we're recording these, and the handouts are also being posted online, okay? So if you like what, and you wanted to show it to someone, the handouts, all that's gonna be online. All right, so this is week three of our intentionality of the course. Um, we spent the first two weeks uh, laying a very, very important foundation um, and you will actually find, we're gonna take a step forward tonight, but we're continuing the really, really important foundation. This third part tonight will be that. So the first week we looked at creation. We looked at attributes of God that you must know and understand to make sense of the story of the Bible. Uh, and then uh, the, the next time, the last time we were together, we looked at the fall, the story of the fall and uh, weaving through and understanding uh, exactly what the nature of sin and rebellion uh, is and uh, how it leads into uh, our overall understanding of the entirety of Scripture that comes from that, okay? Tonight, we're gonna start uh, really the threads portion that's gonna run through the rest of the course. Those first two weeks laid a foundation and what, what we're gonna do this evening, you're gonna see us do a lot more of. Uh, and this is why we're, we're calling the class Threads, uh, because tonight we're gonna look at Adam, the first man, Adam, as a repeated pattern or thread that you will see this pattern and the instructions uh, and the storyline continues through the entire Bible, and the first Adam, the New Testament will tell us, actually points to the second Adam, uh, the last Adam in Christ. <coughs> so with that, we're gonna look at a lot of scriptures. Now, I already have those for you on your sheet. Um, our intent and purpose is for you to, more than anything, Keep your eyeballs up here and pay attention to what I'm saying. You have the scriptures so that you can go home and you can study more of the context. You can open up your own Bible and you, where did he get this? And some of those type of things, okay? Um, but we're, Daniel and I are gonna move at a, at a decent pace as we go through the scriptures. Some of you will be very familiar with this uh, with these storylines of the Bible, and some of it may be new to you, and that's okay. Uh, but you have all of those notes, and again, the whole purpose is so that you can go with the flow of us up here and uh, keep going at a decent pace. Does all that kind of make sense? It does to me. It does to you? Good. good, because we circled up and have been working on this for weeks, so <laughs> if it didn't make any sense to you, We're we, in would, trouble. we yeah. would be We're in, in trouble. We're in big yeah. trouble. Awesome. Okay. All right, with that said, uh, the title of this week is Adam, okay? Adam as a thread and dominion and dynasty. Uh, that may make no sense to you at this moment. Hopefully, by the end of the night, you'll know exactly what that means, okay? So here we go. Uh, I'm gonna highlight Adam as we go through. So instead of camping out on 
uh, the Genesis passages, as we go through each new type or pattern of Adam, you will see, uh, I'll put those scripture references for you. Uh, by the way, uh, just as a reminder, because it has been a number of weeks, um, what we are looking at, these what I'm calling threads, they're also patterns, repeated patterns in the Bible, or the New Testament calls them shadows, or the New Testament calls them types, okay? Types, they are storylines that are repeated that once the whole of scripture is pieced together and Christ comes, you actually look back and you can see with such clarity, oh my goodness, God knew what he was doing the entire time. He's been writing a story for 2,000 years. He's been weaving this together. He's been pulling all of these details. All of it makes sense as an ultimate purpose. And in fact, even when Moses wrote some of these things, the Holy Spirit was working through Moses to point and to say, by the way, this one is coming. Okay? It's all planned. That's the whole purpose of, of, of doing this and all these details. Because even though Moses was the author, and even though uh, David's going to be the author, and, and different people are going to be the author, you're going to realize that the Holy Spirit has been the author over thousands of years, all of it pointing to the Son of God, okay? With that, no more introduction, let's jump into it. Uh, Genesis 5, that is right after Genesis 3, okay? So if you've been reading Genesis 1, 2, and 3, well, I know there's four. Come on, guys. Well, it's playing but off the it's, crowd it's, too, it's in so. short distance. It's in short distance. If you've read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, all right, and 4, uh, by the time you get to 5, <laughs> it's just Cain and Abel. Tell me so. what you think of this language. After some genealogy, now he, named, now he called his name Noah, saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Now you hear that language in Genesis 5 talking about Noah and you as a good reader should instinctively know, oh my goodness, Noah has been linked back to the curse given to the ground when Adam fell and to a promise of rest. That, that promise is coming. So after a list of genealogy, now comes a promise, and we are prompted to pay attention to the seed of the woman, which initiates hope. Now look at these two passages. So I, I show you here, Genesis 3, 17. This is the curse. Look, it's underlined. Cursed is the ground because of you, and in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. That's the curse that's given to Adam. But also remember that to the woman... A promise was given. We talked about this last time. Okay, this is the proto-euangelion, the first gospel, because there is a promise given to the woman that she, that, so I will put enmity, this is the serpent and the woman going back and forth, right? And I, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, God is speaking to the serpent but the promise is, is that a seed, a descendant, we're going to walk through this, but what you'll know about that word is it is a collective singular. That becomes really important, but it's a thread that's woven through. The seed of the woman will produce someone who will crush the serpent's head. So just two chapters later, when it's promised that Noah, this one will give you rest, from your work and from the toil of your hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed, don't you instinctively go, oh, we have a little hope here. There's a promise that's given. Maybe Noah's going to be that rescuer. Similarly with Noah, as the story unfolds, we see that there's a pattern of creation and recreation. When the Spirit passed over or the wind passed over the waters to form the dry land in the very first creation after God had destroyed the earth with the flood in Genesis 1 uh, Genesis 8 5 and 1 it is the wind in uh, uh, Hebrew that word is ruah it's the same word for spirit and wind there's no difference Context is the only thing that tells you. So that same, the ruah passed over the waters and caused it to subside and the dry land appeared. 
also to Noah is given this command to be fruitful and multiply. First, it's given to Adam. You can see it there, Genesis 128, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And then after uh, the, the flood and the recreation, now to Noah, and God blesses Noah and his sons and said to him, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Oh, we're on the back. I'm gonna give you, uh, I'm gonna show you these patterns and then I'm gonna come back in a little bit and I'm gonna build the whole narrative so it makes sense. I want you to see the pattern a number of times. God also makes a covenant with Noah, okay? Genesis 6, 18, but I will establish my covenant with you, right? You're gonna enter the ark, you and your wife and your sons. And then on the other side, God spoke to Noah and to his sons, okay? Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your seed, after you. And then in verse 10, he's going to give him dominion over every living creature, birds and cattle and every living beast, right? All of that comes out. It's very, very much a pattern of what you've just seen with Adam. But similarly to Adam, so remember that hope arose at the beginning of Noah's story when it was initially told to you that Noah, he's going to be one who, who gives us rest, okay? Similar to Adam, Noah has a fall. Right after the ark, after the flood subsides, there's a lot of stories that Moses could have told us about Noah. But if you look at uh, Genesis 9, 20 through 25, very prominent story right there in the middle. It says that Noah planted a vineyard, that it produced many grapes, that he got drunk, and that he was naked. And that his nakedness was exposed. Okay, wait a second here. You mean that's just like Adam who was naked in the garden after he sinned. And now you have our new rescuer, our new promised one. Yes, he had the covenant promise given to him, but he is now after a vineyard. He is found drunk and lying naked in the vineyard. And then there are curses that follow. So ultimately, he is not the hero that we are looking for. So let's, let's look at another one. Um, we'll see yeah, another type of Adam, right? We'll see some more repeated patterns. But let's move on from Noah. And let's look at the patriarchs. Let's look at Adam, or Abraham, excuse me, Isaac, and, and Jacob here. And let's start with remembering the covenant that God made with Abraham. So if you'll just look across the page, uh, you will see Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And then at the bottom of page 19, you see Genesis 17, verses 7 through 8 and 19. That'll give you a frame of reference of what we're talking about when we're talking about God's covenant with Abraham. So I want you to have that for reference, but then think back to the same passage that Jason just just looked at to, to look at some of those patterns between Adam and Noah. We're going to see some between Adam and Abraham here as well. So the enmity between the cursed seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman in Genesis 3, 14 and 15, it'll be overcome because now with Abraham, God says, I'm going to curse those who curse you and I'm going to bless those who bless you. Right To Eve, the part of the curse was that there would be pain in childbearing. Right, We see that even in Sarah, Right, her pain, her shame, uh, her disappointment in, in being barren. Right, And then her even taking matters into her own hands to produce a seed that God could use to fulfill his promise. Right, She tried to do it herself. Uh, and we see through Hagar the, the, the consequences of that but that God still is faithful to his promise, right? And the promised seed that he is talking about all along, and that is through Isaac. Then we see in, in verses 17 through 19 in Genesis 3 where, the, where God says to Adam, the ground is going to be cursed because of your sin. Um, now in Abraham, if you look in uh, Genesis chapter 12 and, and verse 10, you, you understand that God promises Adam, Abraham and his seed that I'm going to give you a land and I'm going to bless you 
and, 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 and multiply you. So you see, even here in, in this pattern, in this type, between Adam and now Abraham, right? Some of these curses from Genesis 3, right? There's another picture of that hope that, that God is going to do something through Abraham and his seed that is going to reverse the, the curse and restore what God had put in the garden in Genesis 1 and 2, right? We see, we see this glimmer of hope as we read that. But then if you move on, let's look a little deeper on the next page there on page 19, um, the blessing. God blessed Adam in Genesis 1 and 2, but then there's blessing that we see between that God, um, God and Abraham, right? In Genesis 1, we see that God blessed Adam and Eve, and he says, be, he blessed them, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. But then with Abraham, we see him say, I will bless those in verse three, or in verse two, he says, I will make you a great nation, and I'll bless you, and I will bless those who bless you, in verse three, and, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So that original creation mandate that God gave to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and to multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it, we see this covenant that God made with Abraham God fulfilling that. He says, I am going to bless you and from your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed and I am going to multiply you and you're going to be a great nation. That language, it, just like it did with Noah, it should point you back to see what God is doing in this story that he is weaving. Same thing, we see that between with this picture of Abraham. And it goes all the way through his life, and you've got several scriptures that you could go back this week and read in Genesis there about these blessings and this promise that God made with Abraham. He just reminds him, he reiterates it all through Genesis. And then we see it passed on to Isaac, beginning in Genesis 26. And then it's even passed on to Jacob, this, this line of the promised seed. It goes from Abraham to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then to Jacob's 12 sons. But we see this thread continue to be woven throughout who we would call the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so just like as with Noah, God established a covenant, he did so with Abraham and his seed, right? We've already looked at this passage, so we don't have to dig in, but look at, the, look at what we've underlined. God says, I'll establish my covenant with your descendants or your seed and the descendants after you. He says, and I'm gonna take you to the land of your sojourning, this land of Canaan, and I'm gonna give it to you for an everlasting possession, then he goes on to say in verse 19, no, but with Sarah, your wife, you will bear a son, not with Hagar, not, not this son that you took matters into your own hands, but with Sarah, your wife, you will bear a son and call him Isaac and I'll establish my covenant with him, same language, for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. So he's continuing to bring this out and then it, quickly, we've already hit a lot of this, but this idea to be fruitful and multiply, that God gave those instructions to Adam and Eve, we see that picked up with Abraham too. He says, I'll establish my covenant with you. He says, and I will multiply you exceedingly. He says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Nations will come from you. Right? He said, I'll make your descendants as the dust. Your descendants will be like the stars. You can't even count them. So we see God working. This covenant that he's established with Abraham is, is carrying that same language as the original instructions that he gave in the garden in Genesis 1 and 2. So I'd like to, am I on? Nope. Now I am? Now Here we go. So, so sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And uh, so, so there's a, a drawing that I would like to, to draw for you because a lot of us are, are visual, right? Um, and so uh, let us begin with Eden. And here is Adam and Eve, but for now we'll do Adam in the garden, okay? And he is the image of God. 
And the space on this page is if you want to copy the drawing so you can refer back to it. That's why you've got a big blank section there in your notes if you want to write in this, at this. Can you guys see this? It's easy enough on the whiteboard. All right, so the initial mandate to Adam and Eve, right, is to, uh, the, you see, the garden is cultivated. That, that is their nice little paradise, but, but they're not supposed to just stay in the garden, all right? Actually, they are supposed to be, be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth and subdue it. Why? Because they're image bearers. Because they've been made in the image of God. And God actually gave Adam and Eve this instruction because, because he made us to create and to explore and to uh, engineer and to take that which was rugged, okay? The garden is cultivated, but the rest of the earth is not. It is wild, and just like God in the very beginning of creation, how he took that which was formless and void and he separated it like the great creator and artist that he is, and he put his image bearers on it, so now he has given that mandate to Adam and Eve. Fill the earth and subdue it with my image bearers. Right? This is the command. This is the mandate. But Adam and Eve fail. They sin. And instead they start to fill the earth with a tainted, destroyed image of God. And any good Bible reader begins to ask the question, what is God going to do? The story unfolds. Noah's introduced. And the earth quickly got so bad that when, when Noah's introduced, okay, that sin was so prevalent over the world that God had to completely destroy everything and start all the way back over. Is that going to fix the problem? Now is Noah and his descendants the seed? Now are you going to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord? No, because the first thing that happens with Noah is drunk and naked. At a he gets drunk and naked just like Adam. So now, then you are introduced to a new man, and his name is Abraham. And Abraham comes from, he sojourns out of a land and he comes to a new land, okay? And the promises that are given to this new land, and it's gonna take a, a much longer precedent as you walk through, but this, this new man, Abraham, who's given these promises, but those promises and that seed are passed down to his descendants, and they all surround this new plot of land, which is, is going to be a pattern of, is this going to be a new Eden? Is this going to be a new place of rest? Is this going to be a new spot where God's image is properly displayed, right? And, and so, this is going to, going to move to Israel. So, so Abraham, and then it's passed to Isaac, and then it's passed to, to Jacob, who becomes Israel. And that becomes this land. And we're going to continue this thread here in just a moment. But this is the storyline that, that you should be uh, paying attention to, right? What is the plan here? How does this unfold for the glory of God to go to the ends of the earth? And much of the discussion in the Old Testament and the promises that are given with the blessings and the curses... That if Israel as a people, that God wants to bless them, if they can obey, if they can be obedient, that God would bless them in such a way that they would be uh, what we would call a, a shining city on a hill. It would be a light that extends, okay? Because 
All the nations would see and would know and they would flock to there because they are so blessed and they would say, who is your God? Okay? And they would want to come to this place of rest and perfection where God's image is so magnificent and on display. That's my art for a shining city on a hill. You see it, don't you? Beautiful, thank you. So, so that's the storyline. So let's, let's think of some of the, the repeated patterns that we've heard here, right? We've heard be fruitful and multiply. What else have we seen? Okay, yeah, we, we've seen covenants. We've seen blessings and curse. Okay, we've seen fall. That's right. Each of our heroes that rises up, we will see, we will see them fall. They're not quite the hero you're looking for. Okay, and it's this, this constant moving forward. So now, now that you see that, okay, now, now listen to, uh, I mean, all of this is centered around, this, this, is, this is how you should read and understand your Bible. This is how you should read and understand the Old Testament. Habakkuk 2.14, right, this promise, and the earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord, okay? God is not a God who, who, who just completely, I mean, he can if he wants to, just destroy it all and start over. And he, and he almost does that with Noah, but he keeps this. There's this, there's this thread of, of if he's working with stuff, he's, he's making promises and he's moving things around and he's starting new things, but it's all to this one end. Is the earth going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord? Or, or is it all just a pipe dream that God should have given up on a long time ago? Okay, that's how you should be reading as these new characters pop up, and that's where it's all going. All right, so, so listen, just as you, as you piece a couple of these more things together, right? So it, it's passed on to uh, Rebecca and Isaac and to Jacob. L look at what it's, it's said when Rebecca's family says goodbye to her, and, and she's now become Isaac's wife, okay? May you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendant, your, your seed, possess the gates of those who hate them. And then again to Isaac, right? Again, this promise of land and blessing to your seed, to your descendants. And I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, okay? That, that was given to Abraham, and now it's given to Isaac. And then again, so that all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Again, that was given to Abraham, and now it's given to Isaac. And then again to Jacob, the same sort of thing. Be fruitful and multiply. Become a a company of, of peoples, and, and you get the blessing of Abraham to your descendants, to your seed. So you're following these promises, and you're asking the question, well, what is going to come of this? So a couple of things in this story, just details, but, they're, but it just helps us continue just to see the magnificence of what God's doing and how some of these details have such significance for us. There's a phrase that only appears two times in the first five books of the Bible. It's, it's the only two times they show up, and it's this phrase, deep sleep. The first time we see it is where? God causes Adam to fall into a deep sleep, and, and when he wakes up, who is there? Eve, right? So there's this new relationship that Adam is given when the Lord caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep, and this is a relationship that was necessary then for Adam to fulfill this mandate to, to fill the earth and, and, and put image bearers all through the earth for the Lord. But then we see God calls Abraham to fall into a deep sleep. And it is there while he is in that sleep that God cuts this covenant with Abraham to establish this covenant with him. Now in both of these situations, they're both passive. Adam. He's passive in this. Abraham is passive in this. The, we, the scripture wants you to see that it is God who is the author. It is God who is the sustainer. He's the one doing the work in, in this situation, right? But, but there's, there's this type that, that shows you both of these places, how God is the one at work. But then we see one other thing. Remember, we've talked about how 
all of these new types, will this be the one to fulfill what God commanded in the beginning? And we see they fail. Well, part of their failure is, is a failure to protect, right? To protect God's creation and what God is doing. With Adam, right, he stood passively by while the snake tempted Eve in the garden. Rather than confront the snake, he just let the, he let the serpent do what he was gonna do, right? Passive. Abraham, do we see Abraham failing to protect his family? Twice with Sarah. The second one was more dangerous than the first one, but, but Abraham is lying to save his own skin, and he kind of puts his wife out there to, to take the fall for them and to, to take the hit, and he repeats it. But, and then we see Isaac do it, right? Following in his dad's footsteps. He does the same thing with his wife, Rebecca. Lies about who they are in order to protect themselves. And so all through this, as we see God working and we see these signs of, no, he's still at work, right? All is not lost. God is still on the throne. But we see it's pointed to, but it's God who our hope should be in, right? It's not, it's not these flawed individuals who are failing to fulfill what God commanded but it's God himself. Okay, so given, given our patterns, fruitful and multiply, the covenants, the blessings and the curses, and even the fall that happens here, now we're gonna quickly look at as David, as the new Adam, okay? Israel. Oh, you got Israel. Oh yeah, we're on the back, sorry. We're not there David. yet. Israel, as David's the covenant. new Adam, okay? So this this promise of this nation and the way that God speaks about Israel as a nation. So Adam was one man who became representative to refer to all of humanity. And so to Jacob, uh, his name switches to Israel and becomes representative of the whole collective nation. Now, the reason that that matters is because of this collective singular seed that I will refer to and that the New Testament will refer to with some intentionality. Okay, Israel, as a nation, as the promised land, as the promised people, as the descendants, right? You followed it from Abraham to Isaac and now Jacob, who is Israel. Uh, they are taken into uh, captivity in Egypt. But what are they doing? What do we find them doing in Exodus 1-7? But the sons of Israel were fruitful and were increasing greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mightily so that, the, so that the land was filled with them. Again, a good reader should hear, oh, Israel is fulfilling their promise that they are fruitful and multiply, which is a good thing. They're those image bearers. Additionally, uh, we see when uh, uh, this uh, section here is on the 10th curse, the 10th plague when Moses is going back and forth with Pharaoh and he goes to Pharaoh and at the end he says this, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And so I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you have refused, okay? And therefore I will kill your son, your firstborn. Okay, this becomes uh, incredibly important. Because Israel is called the firstborn son of God. Well, Adam was also called the son of God. Luke's genealogy ties that together for us and specifically calling Adam the son of God. And then if you pay attention in Genesis 5, 1 through 3, if you pay attention to what God does in the first two verses, how God was the one who created man in his likeness, how God created them, Okay, and then God named them. In verse three, Adam is the one who is creating in his own likeness when he fathers a child according to his image and named him Seth. So Adam is a son of God. This lineage, this is passed down, okay? Now, so you see, we've seen Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and Israel as a nation referred to as the son of God. Now we'll quickly look at David. David as receiving covenant promises, as being one who uh, has this same language and promises that are given to him. Uh, first, in 2 Samuel chapter seven, if you remember the context for 2 Samuel chapter seven, it's a very, very, one of the most important passages in the whole of the Bible. 
Because this is where David was going to build for God a temple, and God came back and told him, no, I am going to build you. David said, I want to build for you a house, God. And God came back and said, no, I'm going to build you a house. There's a play on the word here. And and what it means is I'm going to build you a dynasty. And there's a seed promise that comes to David. Well, the language, who will come from your body, is the exact same phrase in the, uh, in the Hebrew that's given to Abraham in Genesis 15.4. And you can see those there. But look at about how the promise is given to, look, I'm going to raise up your seed after you, who will come forth from your body. Okay? And he will be a son to me. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. So we can add to this list here son language. Okay? So we see fruitful and multiply. We've seen multiple covenants, blessings, and curses. We've seen fall, and now we see son language. Okay? So what what becomes important here with the son language, we will pick up upon this a little further whenever we do another uh, typological thread, but Adam is the son of God, but, uh, and then Israel is given the title son of God, but then the king of Israel is given the title son of God, okay? This pattern, okay, what what we will see is it's ultimately a building thread or a trajectory. And what it's causing us to think through that when you'll see there are a lot of promises that are given to this son of God here that you begin to think, uh, wow, that's a pretty big promise of an eternal kingdom. That's, that's a promise that's pretty grandiose. That's a promise that begins to expand and expand. Okay? Go ahead. So, the rest of the Old Testament, right, with the kings of Israel and then the kings of Judah and the divided kingdom, right, we see all of these disasters, right, these, these kings of Israel that are supposed to be these sons, right, they continue to fail. So there's this question the Old Testament leaves you with of, will there be a king to sit on the throne, right, and we'll look at that more in the future, but it all points to the final Adam, right, or scripture, will call it the second Adam, and that is Jesus. So let's look at him. Let's look at Christ for just a few minutes and, and this type of Adam that, that he represents. It starts with, uh, let's look at Luke's genealogy. We've already referred to it once. But when you think about Luke's genealogy, you also will remember if you've read the New Testament very much, you'll know Matthew has a genealogy. Those are the only two gospels that have a genealogy. Matthew's is very different from Luke's. Right, Matthew starts with Abraham and traces the line all the way to Jesus. Well, Luke's does the, it kind of flips it. It does the opposite. It starts with Jesus and traces it back, back to Adam, the son of God. And so two different purposes with that genealogy, right? Matthew is wanting to show that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the true king of Israel that's been promised to the Jews. Luke says, no, I want you to see that this Jesus is the son of God. He is this promised son of God. And so we see that in Luke 3.23, right? We see in Luke 3, Verse 38, that, that this, what Jason referred to, right? The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So there's that connection, even in the name. Paul talks about this when he, he picks this up, and it's, it's this salvific language. It's, it's this gospel picture for us that Jesus being the final Adam, why is that important? It's because one man's disobedience, the first Adam brought about sin and death into the world, right? And produced many who were sinners. But it's the obedience of the second Adam 
Jesus that is going to bring salvation. So we see this one for one substitution, right? A very important thing for us to understand about the gospel is the substitutionary atonement. The second Adam laid down his life to redeem mankind because of the sin and the fall of the first Adam, right? That's that thread weaving all through scripture. Every time we take communion, we're reminded of this covenant that Jesus establishes through his blood that, it, that accomplished this very thing, right? To redeem, to be our substitute. When he says, this, is, this cup is poured out for you, it's the new covenant in my blood. It's like I am the second Adam who came to take care of, to redeem, and to restore what sin destroyed. Right, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Paul gives us great language there. It says, hey, in the first man, Adam, he became a living soul, but we know that living soul is the one that brought sin and death into the world. But the last Adam, as Paul calls Jesus, is the one who brings life. He is the life-giving spirit. Isn't that a beautiful picture to see that thread go all the way from Genesis to the incarnation of Christ? But then Jesus has a favorite title for himself. It's the, it's the name he refers to himself with the most in the Gospels. And that is the title, Son of Man, right? And Son of Adam, we've already seen, means the same thing. So Jesus picks up that language and he uses that to refer to himself more than any other name in Scripture. And you can see a few examples there. But this ties back to a very important passage in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, it says that there is this son of man, one like a son of man, who's coming up, and he came up to the ancient of days. That's a very important phrase. The Old Testament ends in 2 Chronicles 36, 23. We've got all the prophets after that, but like the story of Israel, the story of the Old Testament is at the end of Chronicles. And the, and the chronicler writes, he says, who can go up? He's calling people to come up to Jerusalem, to come up to where the ancient of days, to the temple, to his dwelling place. And it leaves you though with, well, who can do that? Right, the psalmist talks about that. Who can ascend? Who can go up to the hill of the Lord? Right, we're left with just this, this feeling, this longing of no one can stand before the Ancient of Days. There is no one that can go up and approach his throne because of the sin that mankind has brought into the world. But this prophecy, it says this son of man, he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and then to him was given dominion and a kingdom and all peoples and nations and this everlasting dominion. Do you see that what the first Adam failed to do, Jesus Christ, the final Adam, fulfilled completely? Yeah, where, where we would say the first Adam was kicked out of God's presence. The second Adam can approach the throne Absolutely. and recapture all of that exact same language of what was originally promised. You see that, right? It's right there. And, and even in that title, I know you hear son of man in, in the New Testament a lot, but do you ever link that in your mind to this is son of Adam? You are one like a son of Adam. Now we also have the title Son of God, which gets used in, in many contexts, and you have them written out there, uh, a number of them in the New Testament. But I want you to particularly pay attention to uh, Hebrews chapter one and the verses that I've given for you there, because the author of Hebrews uses this title, Son of God, in Yes, sometimes the New Testament speaks about Jesus being the eternal Son of God and it intends for you to know he's the Son of God. But here, look at, you, you see in, in uh, blue the, the two verses that are there, the, the three verses that are there, that first one, right? You are my son, today I've begotten you, okay? That comes from Psalm 2-7 
or this one. I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. 2 Samuel 7, 14. We all actually already discussed that passage because you must see the trajectory that the author of Hebrews actually intends for you to know and understand that this title son was given to Adam and then it was given to Israel and then it was given to the king of Israel. But these promises, even with the kings of Israel, they all fall too. They all fall down. David and Solomon, and it only gets, it's a dumpster fire after those two. It just gets worse and worse and worse. They all fall. But but the promise of being the son, the special representative is given. And there's promise of an eternal kingdom that's attached to it. They're not only kicked out of Eden, they end up getting kicked out of their own land. Yeah, they get kicked out of this, right? <laughs> is this the shining city on the hill? Is this what it's all supposed to be, right? No, why? Because he says even though those, there's, there's promises of this eternal kingdom and, and an eternal son who has a special relationship with God and all of those things, it ultimately never ever finds its fulfillment because there is one who is coming after all those kings of Israel who's actually eternal himself. That's actually the, the point that the author of Hebrews is making is, is that even this title, okay, that, that's given to Adam, it's given to Israel and the way that it's used, it's actually pointing towards, you're anticipating, it's a thread, it's, it's a projection, it's shadows that are pointing to the ultimate substance that is coming and his name is Jesus and he is the one true son of God that there is no one like him. Now listen to a couple of these things because I want you to see with such intentionality the patterns, the way that the story gets repeated, that Jesus is the true Son of God. He is the second Adam who does not sin in the wilderness like Adam or like Israel or Adam did in the garden. Who protects his own. That scripture reference there in John 18, 8. It's in the garden. Jesus is, uh, the guards have come to, to capture him. They've come to get him. And Jesus comes and presents himself. And in John 18, 8, he says, let all the others go. Leave them alone. You've got me. Unlike Abraham and Isaac who did not protect their own who while his disciples were sleeping, he was preparing to cut a new covenant who presents himself in the garden, unlike Adam who hid, who would stay silent when accused, unlike Adam who blamed. You see, Adam would eat from the tree and realize his nakedness and shame. And what would it take for Jesus to undo Adam's curse? Well, Jesus would have to hang from the tree, completely naked and shamed. Jesus' death overcomes the death of Adam's curse. Jesus promises a recreation, a new earth, a no longer cursed ground with no pain or toil or death. He promises eternal rest. He promises to make all things new again. You see, Jesus is the promised seed of the woman. Okay? He is the blessed seed of Abraham. Remember the promised seed way back, uh, way back in, in Genesis 3. And the promised seed given to Abraham and all those blessings that we've seen. Look at the way that Galatia, Paul speaks in Galatians 3.16, right? Abraham's seed, remember that whole singular and plural? The reason that there's this uniqueness in that word is because it was all pointing to Christ. He is that seed. He is that promised descendant. All of this has been pointing to him. And in him, all the nations will be blessed as the gospel goes to every tribe, tongue, and nation. And the gospel will be fruitful and multiply. And the descendants of Jesus will cover the earth. And it will go to the ends of the earth. So, so, so that the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord. J Jesus promised this to, to, uh, in Matthew 24, right? The gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in the whole world. And, and, and my testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And then again, the Great Commission, hear it with this new language, right? All authority, all dominion, all authority has been given to me, okay? And therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
And then as we've been covering in the book of Acts, Acts 1-8, right? And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be, you will be uh, my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and, and Samaria and, and to the ends of the earth. So back to our picture here and let's ask this question, this question that's looming, that's woven throughout the entire Bible. Will the earth be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord? Yes. And how will it take place even though the first Adam fell and even though the the next Adam fell and even though the next Adam fell and the whole next Adam as a nation and time after time after time. But all of it is leading you down a path because there is coming one true Adam who will redeem us as he hangs on the cross. And that gospel will go to the ends of the earth. The earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord. His image bearers will cover the earth. This is God's plan. This is God's mandate. It's what we are here for. It's why we meet every week. It's why we preach the gospel. All of this is fitting into the mission of God. God to know and to understand that the entire Bible has this thread that is from Adam, that there is coming a second Adam who is going to fix and undo and and make it even better. Remember, we've been talking about in heaven and the new heaven and the new earth and all. It's going to be even better because of the second Adam. This is the thread. This is what you should see as you read your Bible, that there's all these repeated patterns on purpose, because it's one story. Again, so many different authors over thousands of years, but one true author who has been connecting through the Holy Spirit, intending for you to see and for you to ask these questions and for you to to loop all, that this is the story and the theme of the Bible. You must see this thread. That's why, like in Galatians 4, verse 4, where it says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Right, we can see the story of God, right? This is what he intended to do before the foundation of the world. This was his plan. And so Paul could say, hey, in the fullness of time, he accomplished this so that we could see what he's doing and understand it. Yeah. Any questions about this? <laughs> Does this make sense? <laughs> what do we do with it? <laughs> well, how does we apply it? You want to go there? So there, there, there are, we wanted to save just a little bit of time now. There are two really important theological implications. There, there are many, okay? There, there are, there are, hundreds if not thousands of theological implications, okay? But we really wanted to focus on two coming out of this. The first is that you see this and that you understand that this is the church's mission. This is the mission of God. This is, again, why, this is why we meet every Sunday and, and we preach the gospel. And it's why we, we collect our money together and, and we send it to the ends of the earth and we send it to... Uh, to uh, you know, the, the, the poor and the broken parts of, of Bernie and San Antonio, and, and then we send it to, to the other side of the world. And, and it's, it's why we, we want to ask questions like, are we reaching places that have never been reached? And all of those questions, why? Because the glory of the Son of God is worthy. It is worthy of covering the earth. And you and I are called to be swept up in this mission. Okay, you and I are called to find our purpose in this mission, to see it that now under the new second Adam, the last Adam, he has fixed us and he allows us and and we long to be a part of this. Okay, there's a second really important theological implication that I want to spend our last 10, 10 or so minutes on. And that is... This, uh, it, this whole I- idea from the very beginning in the fall and this, this one that is coming, from the very beginning, it, 
is grounding the entire theology of the incarnation. That God has made man in his image in such a way that he will one day become man. He will take on flesh. And and that rooting and that grounding of the incarnation and so many things that follow out of it. I mean, obviously you, you see immediate substitutionary atonement that the blood of bulls and goats cannot wipe away the sins of man, but there has to come one who can live that perfect life and who can do that. And then there's gonna be this, this one victorious king who's, who's gonna rule and to reign. But I wanna turn your mind's eye real quickly to Hebrews chapter five. If you have a Bible, you can flip there. I want to read two passages out of Hebrews, or one passage out of Hebrews five and one out of Hebrews four. Because I want you and I to know and to understand as we contemplate about the incarnation, the the way that scripture speaks about, um, well, about the awesomeness of our king and the one who has been tempted and tried and gone through difficulties and trials just like you and I have, and then the way that he calls us to himself, that that all of this from, from the foundation of the world, from eternity past, was all incorporated into the plan of God. So listen to Hebrews 5, 7 through 9. Speaking about Jesus, in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one who was able to save him from death And he was heard because of his piety. And although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. What I want you to notice about that passage is that Jesus endured trials, loud crying, weeping, processes of uh, discouragement and uh, growing in, in faith and in obedience to his father, that, that, he, that there was training ground that led the son of God to the cross and learned obedience and learned trials and crying and crying out with a loud voice and and begging God and learning to pray and learning to become so strong so that he could become the perfect sacrifice, being tempted in every way as we are. Now go back to Hebrews uh, 4.15. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Listen to verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. It's the magnificence of the incarnation. If you go back two chapters to Hebrews chapter two, verse 17, Listen to this, therefore he, Jesus, had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. All right, so we, we see this picture, he had to become flesh. He had to take on flesh in order that he could be the satisfaction That's what the word propitiation means, so that he could satisfy the wrath of God towards sin, the sin of the first Adam and all of humanity. Jesus had to become flesh so that he could become the propitiation to satisfy the wrath of God so that you and I could be the recipients of the love of God. That's who our high priest is. That's why the incarnation had to happen And when we think of like, you know, I'm glad you read verse 16 in chapter four, 
right? This sympathetic high priest is what allows us to draw near, to receive mercy and grace because it's our greatest need because of the first Adam, right? We stood in need of those things. But Jesus came as the second Adam in order for us to be able to draw near, to be able to go up. Remember the end of the Old Testament says, hey, come up to the ancient of days, approach the throne. Well, without our high priest, it's impossible. But, but the author of Hebrews says, no, you can draw near, you can come up. Yeah, I'm, ju I'm just amazed that as soon as Adam falls, the promise is made there's coming a seed. And we, we've just traced all that through, right? And, and your mind may, may be blown a little bit, but the landing spot, right, is God knew it all from eternity past. And he made us in his image because he was gonna take on flesh. I was in, in seminary when I realized you understand the incarnation is permanent, right? In other words, even after the mission is over, right, after he did the work of dying on the cross and resurrecting, he doesn't just, just throw off flesh and be like, yeah, all right, I'm, I'm going back to my pre-incarnate state. It's permanent. So, so when you see the thread and when you see the plan and the intentionality of God, that like, like um, last week, uh, Daniel made the statement that, that God was the, the one who declared good and evil, and, and when Satan tempted, uh, they were, Adam and Eve were tricked because then they would know evil from the inside, okay? There's a, there's a difference experientially. Well, guess what? There's a difference experientially now, not that Jesus becomes sinful, but Jesus took on flesh. God took on flesh. He knows what it's like to be tempted and to endure trials and to be hungry and famished and cry out to his father. He knows all those things. So this, this I mean, this knowing this is great, but uh, applying this, Right, when we have those moments of doubt, when we have those moments of confusion, when we have those moments of what is God doing in this world? Amen. What is going on in this world? All we have to do is look to scripture and how can we not walk away with confidence that, that, that he is on the throne, he is working, he's been orchestrating all of human history so that in the fullness of time he could send his son so that you and I could be redeemed and be adopted into his family. Right, so the, the cares of this world, the trials we face, the uncertainty of, of our culture and our world today, right? we can leave that in the hands of the ancient of days. Because he said, no, you draw near to me. Your hope is not in this world, your hope is in me and, in, and because of Christ, you can draw near to me. So there's a security, there's a peace that this understanding ought to give you Right, so that you don't have to live in fear, but you can go out with confidence to actually evangelize, right? To share Christ, to live on mission for him without worrying about what this life holds or doesn't hold, right? There, there's a confidence that comes from understanding this so that we can be on mission. Yeah, amen, amen. You guys have any thoughts you wanna share with us? We've got five minutes left. I'll leave you early if you want. <laughs> Amen, right? Amen. If you couldn't hear, she said, guys, we're just blessed that God loves us. He gave his son for us. When you see the magnificence of the story, okay, planned out from eternity past, I mean, part of the reason that, that we do this is we, we want you to see and realize because God has revealed himself in his word. I know it's sometimes it's difficult to read the Old Testament and you kind of get lost in some of the details. That's why we're doing this, okay? And then when you start to see it, you're like, oh my goodness, this God has been writing and leading, leading a path that actually is 
then it becomes abundantly clear. Oh my gosh, yeah, of course, that's what he's doing. Now all of a sudden you understand what Paul's talking about in, in Romans 5, or you understand what the author of Hebrews is talking about, okay? With, with this sun language, and, and, and like, like you see that, the, these are the threads, these are the patterns that God is leading us on, okay? Amen. All right, Daniel, why don't you close us in prayer, and then we're gonna get out here five minutes early. You're welcome. Don't get... <laughs> Don't get used to it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we pause tonight and God marvel at the wonder of who you are. God, it is good for us tonight to just be in awe, to be speechless, uh, to be unable to comprehend the magnificence of your love and your grace and your mercy. God, that you as the sovereign creator of all would choose to orchestrate a plan that would send your son to be the second Adam, to redeem us, those who stood cursed, those who were enemies of you because of sin, but yet in your love you chose to bring salvation through your son so that we could draw near to you. God, may we draw near with confidence. May we boldly approach your throne of grace with this understanding that it was the plan all along for us to do so through the work of Jesus. So may we leave here glorifying his name and living on mission and, and obedience to his call on our lives to make him known, to bear his image to be fruitful and multiply as we take the gospel with us as we leave this place tonight. May we do so uh, with a new hunger and, and a new boldness and a new passion because we've seen and we understand a little more. We've tasted a little more and seen that you are good. So may we leave here with that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.